Hello, everyone. My name is Adol Corker, and I'm the founder and the CEO of the AB Corker Foundation for Mental Health. Our mission, as you all know, is to raise awareness, remove the stigma, and enforce the role of physical exercise and physical health in mental health. Well, you know, we're here again uh, with a podcast that I believe is extremely helpful and important for us to really understand that we all cannot survive uh, every day in our life without eating. So really, does what we eat really impact how we feel? And does how we feel impact what we eat, when we eat, and how much we eat? Well, these are all very important questions because they reflect not only on the importance of food in our survival, but also of the importance of food in our well being, both mental and physical. I could not find a better person to have this topic discussed uh, other than an individual who has really been immersed in food for a long, long time. Blanche Shaheen is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, a, a TV host, a, a journalist turned cooking show host. Uh, is a cookbook author. I personally purchased her cookbook when I saw her at the Arab American Foundation meeting and I read the entire thing. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And as someone who loves to cook, I really was extremely happy to see someone who is bringing back those old wonderful recipe of the culture I grew up in. Well, Blanche, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. It's an Thank honor you. and pleasure to have you on board. Like you and I have had some discussion a little bit beforehand, is really how does food fits into our personal life, social life, and culture in general? Can you tell me a little bit about where do you see food in relationship to that? And maybe go a little bit beyond that and discuss a little bit about feelings and emotions? Great question and honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, for me, I feel like, especially as a Palestinian American, that food is a huge part of our identity. Uh, as people of the village, people didn't have much, but they had the food that they foraged, that they grew together, that they harvested around the olive trees. And for, for me, it was something that I wanted to continue this legacy, especially during an industrial revolution where people have been so far removed from their food source. So people that go to Costco or Trader Joe's and they buy the food, it's really not the same as foraging your food and growing your food. And that's why a lot of Palestinians, when they come to America or any other country for that matter, it is so vital for them to grow their food. Most every household, I'm sure, uh, you know, Syrians and Lebanese can attest to this as well. They all have a lemon tree, a fig tree, an orange tree in their backyard, uh, maybe a grapevine. And they want to continue these traditions of picking the food together as a family, doing something fabulous with it that they could share around the table. And for me, that was so important in writing this cookbook was to capture a lot of these traditions and then pass it on to the next generation so that it's not all lost in the takeout box, which is really far removed from that experience. Yeah, that, that is so true. Um, well, now that we're really talking about how uh, you know, growing, preparing, uh, going over those recipes that we've inherited over time, and then sharing it with families and friends. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about where those emotions, things like depression, anxiety, the things that we traditionally talk about as part of our mental health and mental well-being, how does that, where does food fits into that? Well, you know, if you talk about it in today's perspective, some people see that as like a crutch or an unhealthy 
uh, addiction to food. You know, some people, when they want to drown out their emotions, they'll go attack a, a bag of Oreos or, or a bag of M&Ms and drown their emotions that way. But when you're cooking with the family and you're cooking healthy Mediterranean whole foods together, it is so nourishing, not just for the body, but for the soul. You know, when you're all together, like when you're picking green beans together as a family, you know, sometimes I have my, my kids engaged in that activity to make a dish called fasulia and everybody's snapping the beans together and, you know, you put it in the pot and you smell the aroma in the kitchen, which you don't get from fast food. And, and it fills the kitchen with this beautiful smell of garlic and onions. And it's also healing on so many levels. Uh, there's really nothing can compare to that. And when you're eating it together as a family and you're talking about what happened during the day and you're experiencing this food, it is nourishing on multiple levels. You know, it's not just the food that you're putting in your mouth. You're also experiencing that time together. Another example I can think of too is like, we have our annual ma'mul or date cookies that we make and it's a very tribal activity, right? So there's somebody that's taking the dates and, and grinding them and adding the spices to them. There's somebody else that is working on the semolina dough. Somebody else is going to be shaping the cookies. And then of course, baking the cookies and each aspect of it does take quite a bit of time, but sometimes I feel it's important to take a break from the busyness of society and work on that together. And when you have, you know, five, six people working on cookies and then you smell this beautiful fragrance of mahlab, which is like the ground um, uh, cherry kernel that's used to flavor the, the cookies, you smell that with the cinnamon and the other warming spices and you all do it together. By the time the cookies come out of the oven, you're so filled with the, like the love of togetherness that you don't really feel the need to eat, you know, 10 mahmouds like you would need to eat 10 Oreos. It's a very different experience, one or two, and you're just completely filled with that, like that love and that flavor, that quality that you just can't get from mass produced food. I hope I answered yeah. your question in a way. Well, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, you have to some extent. Now, I have to reflect on the fact that we're living in a different society today. We're right. very widespread. Uh, we don't see our, you know, family members. Like I just recently returned from a trip in Ohio where I saw family members that I haven't seen almost the entire COVID period. Uh, but what I found to be really important is that even when I cook by myself and I make certain food like baklava or any type of Mediterranean dish that is often prepared during holiday times or otherwise, I found that sharing it with a friend really brings in that sense that, that, that I, I, I really care for that person that I'm sharing this food with. And I'm hopeful that it would be uh, a, a message of, 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 of reaching out to them with something that would be expressing love and caring and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the world that we're living in has been, like I said, spread out quite a bit. And, but there's still a role for food preparation, even if you do it on your own, just to be able to share it with other individuals. 100%. I agree with that. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, on the, on the other hand, you know, where do you see emotions? Uh, for example, I know that kids who consume a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of a lot of sugar might be might tend to be anxious or more active, but also when we're stressed and anxious, we tend to gravitate to food that have a lot of carbohydrates in it, and we tend to eat more of it. You know, do you feel that? Uh, where do you see that as 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 a as a uh, culinary expert in in your own personal career? Well. You know, I, I'm not only about uh, the food that I cook, I'm also, I've also been a fitness instructor since 2013. And I've always had people grappling with that, like what, you know, uh, sometimes they'll exercise and exercise, but they feel like they're not losing any weight and they feel like they're dousing their trouble, like they're craving, they have a lot of cravings, right? And one way I always feel to combat the cravings is I feel like when the body's well-nourished, you don't tend to crave that 
unhealthy food as much, right? And so that's why I love the Mediterranean diet is it is really, really intuitive. So you have the healthy fats, you have the lean proteins, and then you have the fruits and vegetables for micronutrients and polyphenols. And then when you combine all of those together, for me, the Mediterranean diet is like Nirvana for all of those things. And that's why I feel like um, even when, when I notice a difference, like when I have visited Palestine many times, people are pretty much thin there. I mean, you get outliers, of course, the people that eat the mountains of rice, but I feel like people there are far healthier than when I come back to the United States. I look at the Palestinian community in the United States, there's far more obesity. And I feel like part of the reason is that sound diet, if they go back to the sound principles of eating whole Mediterranean foods, they don't crave those excess carbohydrates as much. And, you know, I always say, I always like to prioritize like healthy lean protein because I feel like the body's always searching for protein first. And if you don't get those protein requirements, you're always going to be craving excess carbohydrates just from a fitness perspective. Um, but yeah, definitely, I, I, it's so funny how you could see population coming from the same root place and how dramatically different they can be because one is eating the food of origin and the other has strayed away and has you know filled their diet with highly industrial that just doesn't even resemble real food, food at all at the end of the day. Right. I think there's been a, quite a few studies that looked at uh, Indian, Indian from India, Asia, who came to England and actually changed their diet because of that move. And they found that the incidence of certain illnesses and diseases actually uh, that are common to the West has become more prominent in those Indian because they really changed their diet. Uh, there, there's a part of, of, there's something called comfort food. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, let's just uh, talk about this a little bit, because I personally um, uh, continue to cook at home, uh, uh, although I am single now. And I, I, do, I do find uh, going back to making some of those meals that my mother made, you know, whether it's kibbe, whether it's, um, whether it's, uh, uh, fasulie, uh, which is beans and rice, uh, uh, whether it's uh, certain certain meals that I've always like when I was a child, my mother offered it to me and gave it to me where I felt a sense of security and happiness and content. Now, comfort food is really a big deal for me. And for the majority of us who really still see that sense of warmth and loving when the food is offered to us, which we gravitate to, what is comfort food for you? That's a great question. For me, it, of course, it always gravitates towards childhood, right? So I, it could go in either extreme. For me, it is like stuffed kusa, which is uh, zucchini stuffed with uh, lamb and rice. And it's funny how most kids like that too. And I, I think they intuitively know that it takes a long time to make, right? So when my mom would make uh, stuffed grape leaves, which I also absolutely love, and the stuffed, uh, the stuffed zucchini, it wasn't just something she did in a half an hour like a hamburger helper and called it a day. I mean, she would take two, three hours to make these meals. And she always complained, I take half the day to eat the meals and you guys just take five minutes to eat them, consume it. And, you know, it's like we taste her love. Uh, and in Arabic, there's a word for that called, we talked about this before offline, nefas, which is like when you infuse your love and heart and soul into the dish that you make. And I always felt that from my mom's cooking growing up. So when I ate these like really time consuming meals, I didn't take them for granted. But then it could also be something totally simple, like this is a recipe in my cookbook, uh, Feast in the Middle East called dandelion greens. So uh, this is something that reminded me of my aunt Pahia. She's my great aunt and she loved to make dandelion greens and she'd make them with like onions and she'd squeeze tons of lemon juice on them and Palestinian olive oil. And my favorite thing was to take pita bread and smear it with hummus and then put a bunch of dandelion greens in there. And that to me is like the ultimate comfort sandwich. And that might sound weird to some people, but it's like, literally when I take a bite, I think of my childhood and it's super healthy. I mean, it's so funny how we intuitively knew how to combine things. Like for example, you take 
the dandelion greens, which is high in vitamin C and, and iron, but when you combine it with olive oil, you get like the, the fat soluble vitamins are absorbed that much better. They knew how to boil the dandelion greens because that removes a lot of the oxalates, which would, you know, bind with nutrients and take it out of your body. Otherwise, if you ate it raw, some people like to eat raw greens, but I don't know, Palestinians knew that you had to boil the greens to take out the oxalates. They're not thinking about oxalates, but when I think about it from a modern perspective, I'm like, oh, they knew exactly what they do it to do. So um, those are two huge comfort foods for me. And I, I know they're very unconventional, but I still, to this day, I can't resist it if it's on a table, you know? Yeah. yeah. Sounds awesome. Uh, you know, like you and I talked a little bit uh, before this uh, discussion uh, is that the, the offering of food is something that we've experienced uh, uh, from the minute we're born. Mm -hmm. uh, the, our mother offered us the breast milk. And, and as you know, breast milk tend to have a high sugar content, not a lot of protein. And so there's really a, a, a comfort in having sugary sweet stuff. And, and this continued to evolve in our life as we are growing up, our needs are increasing uh, for nutrition. The, the, there is a component here of the emotional part of the caring part of the, of the uh, offering part of the food, but then there's also the content of that food that are associated with that. And over time, that changes quite a bit because once we're no longer breastfeeding, now we're out on our own, our mother preparing the food, they're giving it to us. So throughout that process, we build that connection with food what it is, what its content is, and who's offering it to us. So we have that emotional connection between the two of them. We have someone who is offering to us because they love us and care about us. And we have food content that was out there that often, often reflect, you know, what they're really, what they're really giving us. So at the, what I'm really trying to reach is that sometimes the sugary, sweet, comfort food that we have as children still attractive to us because it really reminds us of, of, of that initial original connection that we have. I still love sweets here and there. Uh, I try not to you know, rely on it, but I know that I think when you come to offering food, if you are a food centric kind of a person, you tend to offer more of it to the people that you love. And as a result, they may get overweight and, and, and in part you may be because you're overweight as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, and it's, it's a great point that you bring that it stems from childhood, right? Starting with mother's milk, which is often very sweet, right? Um, and, and I think that the, the problem is when you want to give too much love and you want to overstuff somebody thinking that you're going to take away their sadness by offering them that one extra cookie or that, you know, extra scoop of rice, and I've actually witnessed this a lot in my family and I grapple with that because I've been surrounded by a world of fitness and I come from a family that's very heavily dependent on food as love. It could be overkill too, right? right? Sometimes I've actually had arguments like with my dad, he's a diabetic and I have arguments with him all the time. And it's hard because he's grown up with his mom. You know, they came from Palestine and then they, you know, where they're, they fled war, you know, and then you come to the land of plenty here and it's only natural for them to be like, oh, look, you could have extra this and extra lamb. He's also got gout, by the way, because uh, of all the excess meat that he's eaten over the years. And so when anything that's too much, I mean, that that's what, what I think our uh, society, our community grapples with so much. And that's why we see so much of that obesity, I think, as you really hit that nail on the head. It's like, food is love. So let's give more of it, you know, without, <laughs> without a turnoff mechanism. Right. And that's, you know, and, and that's what I've found most challenging uh, as somebody who's been in the fitness community for so long too. This was absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's, it's a great way to talk about food and our mental health and physical health and, and how food is so important in our life not only for survival, but also for living, living our life, uh, uh, living it with 
family and friends and enjoy uh, what nature had provided us with that we're able to create magic with, such as the magic that you created in your cookbook, Blanche. I, I really thank you for that. It's been a pleasure. And I wish you, considering the time of the year, uh, a wonderful holidays and a much, much better 2022 that we've experienced in the last two years. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> Well, for my audience, I thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a podcast provided to you by the A.B. Corker Foundation for Mental Health. We're here to help you make a difference in your life by raising awareness, removing the stigma, and enforcing the role of physical exercise and, and physical health in, in your mental health. I thank you so much for being part of these podcasts. And I also want to remind you that we rely heavily on your support in being able to do the work that we do to make a difference in the life of those afflicted with mental health challenges. So to reach out to us, it's abkf.org. Click on that donate button and please help us make a difference. Thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.